you have your Bibles, please open to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2, this wonderful Sunday morning here at First Baptist Church. I appreciate Brother Goldman speaking this morning. If you missed that Sunday school lesson in there about stewarding the truth, you missed a good one again. I tell you what, you don't want to miss anything this month here at First Baptist Church. Every service I think will be a help and a blessing to you. And tonight we'll have a special speaker for us asking God to do something great here in 2023 at First Baptist Church. I'm praying that God will grow the church. I don't mean by that numerically, though I believe souls will be added to the church this year. But also, individually, that each one of us will grow in our spiritual walk, our spiritual understanding, and our spiritual application to the Word of God. Partly what Pastor Goldham has mentioned this morning, that that truth, when we steward the truth correctly, it's not just about knowing the truth, but about living the church, the truth, where everything we look at in the world is viewed through the lens of God's Word, His truth. I've pointed out the last few weeks that we live in what's been defined as a postmodern society, postmodern world, where truth has now become relative. Truth is everything that I want it to be, and it's nothing that I desire it not to be. If I view it to be true, then it is in this world, in this culture, true. If I view it not to be true, well, then you can't change my mind. And, and quite frankly, you're out of line if you tell me that what I think to be true is true. If not, then don't rain on my parade. Don't tell me that I can't do what I want to do. Don't tell me that I can't be who I want to be, whether it's a different gender or marry whoever. Don't rain on my parade. Whatever I view to be true, this is this culture, then that is true and there's no other standard nor source of truth. Of course, the Bible is completely opposite of that thought process. The Bible does not say that it is good if we do what's right in our own eyes. In fact, it said it is bad if we do what is right just in our own eyes. The entire book, the book of Judges, is encapsulated in that statement. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And it was not a positive positive statement. We live in a culture, we live in a world that to demean someone else's position is to be intolerant and even to be guilty of a hate crime. This past week, or the past couple weeks, an NFL Hall of Fame coach by the name of Tony Dungy, for many years coached the Indianapolis Colts and coached my favorite quarterback, Peyton Manning. Don't laugh. He can be my favorite. You can have your favorite too. Those of you who love Charlie Batch. And if you know that name, shame on you. Shame on you, you're a true Lions fan if you know that name. But he's a, a staunch Christian. Staunch Christian. Outspoken faith for Jesus Christ and the truth from the Word of God. Came under criticism, immense criticism, and terrible uh, condemnation because he said in a public statement that he did not agree with LGBT being, and that it was a lifestyle and a choice. They came back and said, well, you can't say that. Everyone knows that that's ridiculous. It's not a choice. It's not a lifestyle. It is an edict. It is, it is a truth. And now they're under attack, or he is under attack for statements that we believe from the word of God. My friends, truth is under attack, but in this culture, in this world, everything is shaped by context. How I was raised, my particular culture, my own views, how I feel about it, how I see it, is the same as everything else. Science is gone. Feeling is now science. Emphatic statements are rejected. Those who take a position are scorned. Unless your position is, everything goes. And everything goes except truth. The Bible, Colossians, brings us to the point of our theme this year, rooted in him. Colossians chapter 2. Beginning verse number 6, the Bible says, As ye have therefore... Received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, that is Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead 
bodily. He says in Jesus Christ, the Godhead was clearly displayed. That the Trinity of God, the power of God, the truth of God, clearly displayed in Jesus Christ. In him is the Godhead displayed bodily. And he, the plural, to the church at Colossae, to be read at Laodicea, and he, to be read for generation upon generation because God promised to, to preserve his word to all Christians of all, kind, of all time. And ye are complete in him, that is Jesus Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. Lord, we come to your word this morning. We come humbly, knowing that we need your touch. Lord, we need your spirit to illuminate the, the truth from the word of God in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirit this morning. Lord, I ask that you would help us to understand areas, thoughts, ideas in our life that don't please you. And that not only would we understand that, but that we would commit those areas, those thoughts, those ideas, those perspectives, those errors to you, and that we would follow you. Lord, I pray that today that your word would go forth like you've promised, that it would accomplish everything that you want it to, that there would be no distraction in the service this morning. Lord, we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We are obsessed. Humans, USA, First Baptist Church, we're humans, right? We're obsessed with controlling things. Now, there are those special people who, have, who would be called control freaks, but all of us want to have control. You say, no, no, I don't mind at all. Well, let me, let me just walk down this path, and, and you come to your own conclusion about control freaks, how we're all control freaks. We want to control our own destiny. We desire to control our own lives. We are surrounded by ways to control situations that should be out of our control. We edit resumes. We change online profiles. In fact, there are story upon story where we're in an online dating world, all right, uh, which if you're married, you shouldn't be a part of. Side note. But in online dating world, people will go to meet somebody and they're like, well, you don't look like your picture. They're like, well, I used an old picture. Why would they do that? In fact, I read one this past week. Someone met, uh, this guy showed up to meet this girl he'd met online and it was a blind date and he got there and there was an elderly lady. And he was surprised, him being his mid-twenties. He went to this lady and said, are you so-and-so? And she said, no, no, I'm this person. I used, now get this, my granddaughter's picture on the profile. Hmm. Apparently he ran out the door. We want to control our cars, our homes, our jobs, our lives, our finances. In fact, it's gone so far in the world and where it leads that, that people now, and there, there's a whole uh, research dedicated to this, to design what they call designer babies. I don't know if you've heard about this at all, but they want to edit, they want to edit the DNA code. And it, the beginning of it is so they can stop disease. But beyond that, they say you can edit for eye color, intelligence, hair color, and anything that you want. Because inside of us, we have a desire to control things. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. And the devil asked Eve what God had said and then submitted to her that, listen, if you eat of this fruit, you will know the difference between good and evil or you will be in control. Right now, you're under God's control. You're under his rules and his garden. But, but Eve, this is the path where you can be in control. And you can do what you want to do. And Of course, we understand that Eve did eat of that and then gave to Adam. The Bible says was with her. We have a desire to be in control, to control situations. This innate and overwhelming desire to be in control of my life, my circumstances, my situation, my finances. This desire of control is the opposite of what I'm called to be as a follower of Jesus Christ. 
I am not, I'm not called to take control. I am called to leave my control, to let him have the control. It's an addiction, and the opposite of de dependence. Look in verse number six, please, in your Bibles, Colossians chapter two. The Bible says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Last week we began this particular passage, and I gave you just one point, I'll give you the other two today, about abiding or walking in him, or walking in Jesus Christ. My desire, God's desire, and I hope your desire, is to be a real Christian. I don't think you want to be a fake. I don't think you want to be a fraud or a hypocrite, but you really desire as a follower of Christ to really follow Christ. Not just in word only, though sometimes in our life that's what happens. Is it not? We desire to be a Christian, we claim to be a Christian, but when we evaluate the day, the week, we're like, oh my goodness, I was a terrible, no good, rotten Christian today. Anybody else ever feel that way in the day? A time? Am I the only one? You're like, today, you know what? That attitude I had, I wrecked it. I ruined it. That was bad. That was bad. All right, that reaction I had, that was not what Jesus Christ would have had. Oh, I justify it. Sure, right? We can justify it. And, and they deserved it. And I gave them the truth. I told them exactly what they needed to hear, but, but it wasn't what Jesus Christ would have done. The decision I made was not on his understanding, but on my understanding. The choice I made was for me, not for him. And God desires, I desire, and I think you desire to be real. And, and here the Bible says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Let me give you two points this morning that I think will be a help to you to walk in Jesus Christ. Last week, I said this, to walk in him is to stay close to him. Right, that was the point of last week's sermon. To walk in him means to stay close to him. And you can't abide with Jesus, you can't walk in him if you're not close to him. I will not re-preach the message. If you didn't hear it, I ought to, you ought to go back and listen to it. It's from the Bible. But I want to give you two more thoughts today about walking in him. This morning, understand this, to walk in him means to lean on him. Now look at what the verse says here. The verse says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did we receive Christ Jesus the Lord? Well, we received Jesus Christ by putting our faith in him. Right, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Believe, put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So to believe in Jesus, to put my faith in him, is how I receive Jesus. As many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. The verse here says, as ye have therefore, or in that manner that you received Jesus Christ, which was by faith, it was not by works. All right, it was nothing that I did. It wasn't that I finally got enough services at church and then I got Jesus Christ. It wasn't that I finally gave enough money to church and then I got Jesus Christ. It wasn't that I did enough good things and then I got Jesus Christ. It was nothing that I did except put my faith in Jesus Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord in that manner, you didn't get him by working toward him. You got him by putting your faith in him. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. In that manner of faith, use the same faith as you live. Or to walk in him means to lean on him. I was out of town this past Wednesday, Thursday. I mentioned that, and I heard Pastor Scott did a great job, watched almost all of the service afterward, and I thought it was a great service, uh, even with some of the people being sick, and we just, we're in that realm right now. But on that plane, as I landed, there's a little child in front of me, cute little girl, big blue eyes, smiling. My kids are past that stage. Thank the Lord. The little child was there bouncing around without a care in the world. She's bouncing there. She did great on the, this little girl did great on the plane, partly because I had noise-canceling headphones on. So I, she, maybe she didn't, I have no idea. But I thought, 
thinking about this sermon on Sunday, and this little girl, and I'm interacting with her, I'm making faces, because that's what I do, all right? I know you're not surprised. I'm making faces, and people around me are looking at me like I'm a, I'm a freak and a weirdo. That's okay. I'm okay with that, all right? I'm making faces, and she's giggling. And, I, and I'm thinking about this sermon, thought about this little girl, that this is how we're called to live as a Christian. This little girl's just bouncing away, bouncing away. Time to get off the plane, you know what happened? Her mom picked her up. Didn't have to carry a single piece of luggage off that plane. She didn't. She just got carried. Uh, when she was laying there, she got a little bit, you know, a little, little hungry. She made a little noise, couldn't talk yet. Eh. Right? What did mom do? Like digging through the bag. What's in that bag? Everything. I mean, I remember when my kids were young, all the treats they now offer kids, these puffs. You know, moms, I love them puffs. I bought them for me, not for my kids. What's in that, what's in that diaper bag for church? Oh, it's snacks for Howell. Let's tell you what. But every one of the needs that this child had was taken care of by this loving and caring mother. And this mom was just beaming. And, uh, and she smiled and giggled. And we were just we were interacting a little bit and talking about what was going on. This is what we're called to do as Christians, to lean on God. You say, well, pastor, <laughs> pastor, I've been saved 20 years now. I know I should live by faith. And what I want to give us this morning is not something we don't know, but maybe something that still trips us up. That we still are guilty of leaning on our own understanding. You see, we're called to live by faith. To abide in Jesus is to walk by faith or to lean on him every single day, all day long. It means that I don't live any part of my day apart from Jesus Christ. It means when I get up in the morning that I lean on Jesus. Lord, I need your help today. Lord, I don't know the decisions that I'll have to make, but Lord, I need you today. It's not just that I spend some time with God, though that's part of it. Not just that I pray for part of my morning, that's part of it. But it's that all day, every day, I rest, I lean on Jesus, or I let him carry me around all day. If this little child, and children do this sometimes, they get a little mind of their own, right? They'll want to be put down. But they lack the ability to do anything except express their desire to be put down. And then you can set this little child who can't move or walk or feed themselves or work. You put them on the ground. They can do nothing except cry and kick their little feet and move their little arms. And that's just like you and me if we're honest with ourselves. Sometimes we fight against what God wants. We fight, Lord, I don't need you. Put me down. And it's like he sets us down. The Bible says this. He said, you can't add one centimeter to your height. You can't even control your own height. How do you think you control life around you? And there we go. No, God, I don't need you. I'll sit here on the ground and lay there. You see, our job, our responsibility to abide in Jesus is to lean on him, to trust him for every part of my day, my health, my finances, my concerns, my decisions. Faith means trusting God to do his part. Faith means understanding that problems are really God's problems. I was hoping to have the end of the story, but I don't have the end of the story yet. We had a house fire with the uh, men's home. They told me they'd let me know everything that would happen last week or a week and a half ago now. And they bumped me down the road on decisions a little bit. I'm going back tomorrow for another decision. Now, I have full confidence that God's hand is inside of all of this. I've been praying, and many of you have been praying, that God will smile upon our situation. And I know, I know that God has a solution. Here's the situation. We need a house for the men's home. But it's not my problem, it's God's problem. My job is only to find out how God's going to solve it. Now, along the way, it means that I ought to do a few things. I ought to look for houses, which we have done. It's like this, if you don't have a job, you say, Lord, I need a job. If you sit and lay at home on your bed, do you think God will bring you a job in your bed? Yes or No. No, we'd say, listen, go put some resume, resumes in, and God will make his solution plain. And so often God calls upon us to put some feet to his work. But it's his problem. He will provide the house. I sat down this past week. I was in there Friday, again in a meeting, and, and I sat down and said, this is what we need. 
All right? And I, and I told the lady this. I said, listen, this is God's problem. She said, oh, that's good. I said, I'm waiting for you to tell me yes on Monday. She's like, well, I promise we'll meet one more time. What happened was they, they were asking for permission to do this house here in Bridgeport. They want to make it happen. They're trying to cover themselves. They've now sent it on to the attorney. I'm not worried about attorneys, are you? I have the Lord. You listen, in my life, in your life, it's not my problem, it's God's problem. The Bible says this, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Remember one time that a man preached the message on that passage right here at First Baptist Church. And he specifically pointed out that word casting. And he had a handkerchief with him. And he stood right over here and he said to cast means to take that burden and to throw it at God. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. My friends, if you want to abide in Jesus, I'm going to abide in Jesus. We must take our burdens and cast them on Jesus Christ. And if you're carrying concerns and burdens today, then you're not abiding in Jesus. You're doing it on your own. You can say, well, pastor, I'm in church, I'm reading my Bible. But the Bible says that if I, as I've received Christ Jesus, I must walk in him. I've received him by faith. I've got to walk in faith. Lord, what would you have me to do today? Lord, I've got a big concern. And there are concerns that there are no way that we can solve them. There are health concerns that are completely out of our hands. Those times we know we have to depend upon Jesus. It's the ones where our minds start to work when we have problems. There's a bill. And we know how to solve a bill. We just need more money. And we know how to get more money. We just have to work some more. And we know how to work some more because we've got energy. We can find this job. And listen, that's not depending on Jesus. It says, Lord, I've got this bill. Now, I know how to work, but I need you to show me what you want me to do. Lord, I need your hand on me. I need to lean on you. Lord, I want to cast my care upon you. The Bible in Romans chapter 4 speaks to us of Abraham. It uses a powerful, powerful description. The Bible says this in Romans 4. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be a, by grace to the end of the promise. Might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed. And here it is in verse 18. Who against hope, is Abraham, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead, even when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's room. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. This passage is referencing the place where God said, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. Abraham said, God, I don't have a son. And God said, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Abraham said, but God, I'm too old. Sarah overheard the conversation and she laughed. And God said, Sarah, why'd you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. And God said, but you did laugh. I heard you. All right, in a nutshell, that's what happened. The Bible here in Romans tells us that Abraham staggered not at the promise. The promise of God and sometimes those promises cause us to stagger. Like, Lord, how are you going to do that? Lord, I know what you promise, but I don't see, I don't see how you're going to accomplish that. And Abraham didn't stagger. A little phrase I want you to remember. It's not no doubt, but it's no doubt. It's not no doubt, but it's no doubt. You see, if we walk by faith, there will obviously be an element that we don't know, where we don't understand. If we know it all and see it all, that's not called faith, that's called sight. And Jesus said to his disciples, you're blessed because seeing me in my resurrected form, you believed. But there'll be those who are more blessed because they haven't seen me and they have believed. It's not the fact that there's never any doubt in our minds, but it's that we say no to doubt. Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this, 
but I'm not going to dwell on that. Lord, I don't understand how you're going to solve this problem, but I trust you. I'm leaning on you. Lord, I'm, I'm leaning in your word, your help. There's a little creature in the ocean called a whelk. Spiral shell. It is a predator to an oyster. And what this little creature will do with a beautiful shell is it'll drill a little hole in the shell of the oyster and it will begin to suck out the oyster. And it'll suck it out bit by bit, little by little, until the oyster is gone. And that's what doubt will do when we don't say no to it. If we allow doubt to fester in our minds, to have a place in our minds, we will begin to have our faith destroyed. We'll begin to question the God of the universe, to, to question his goodness, to question his provision, to question his power. It's not no doubt, but no doubt. To walk in him means to lean on him. But number two this morning, to walk in him means to conform to him. Simple word, obedience. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. A command. Obedience is quite simple. You either are or you're not. There's not a third place in that, in, in that column, there's a third column. I'm either oh, following Jesus, I'm obeying him, or I'm not. George Murray, a missionary, was once asked by a crowded church, what is your idea of commitment? And George Murray is the one who held out a blank piece of paper and said, it is to sign my name at the bottom and let God fill it in as he desires. You see, in our life, we often have three different responses to what God wants us to do. Sometimes we deny Say, God, that's not what I want to do. I don't think what you're asking is fair or right or true or good. I don't see it that way. I don't want to do it. People in the Bible that had this same reaction, they said, God, I'm not going to obey you. I'm going to turn away from following you. Deny. They denied Jesus. I hope that you're not a denier of Jesus Christ. I hope you don't deny his word, his commands, but, but we will deny what he wants us to do. The second response is a little more devious. We disregard it. We don't deny it. We don't even really disagree with it. We just disregard it. We don't view it, like Pastor Gordon was pointing out, to be as important or value it like we should. We say it this way. Well, I know that God wants me to do this, but, but, those of you with children, have you ever had your children say that? Be glad to, but. And parents will sometimes say, no ifs, ands, or buts. We do it as Christians. You know what? I'm going to give, but. I'm going to serve, but. I'm going to have faith, but. I'm going to walk with God, but. I'm going to apologize, but. I'm going to do this, but. And if we're not careful, we will not, not deny it, but we will disregard it we'll excuse it away many Christians have been guilty of disregarding what God wants many believers shamelessly have to admit that God has spoken they've listened they've heard but they disregard it we deny we disregard but number three I think it's probably the greatest trap of the devil in the Christian life it's not to deny, not to disregard, but it is to delay. They say, I'm going to do that. Just not right now. In a secular sense, there are millions of diets every year started tomorrow. After the holidays. Next Monday. After vacation. After this over time, then I'll start this diet. Many savings accounts that will be began next year after the raise, 
after this bill, after this payment. There are many tasks at a house to be fixed that will be begun next week. I'm going to fix that window next week. That door, it'll be fixed. That roof will get done next week. The many cars that are broke, that have been broken down on the side of the road where the problem was known and they were on the way to the mechanic shop for the last three months. And my friends, there are many lives who are on the road of life, broken down and in disrepair. Not because the problem wasn't known, not because the problem wasn't taken seriously or understood, but because they fell prey to this thought process, I'll just do it later. My friends, if we're going to walk in Jesus Christ, if we're going to abide in Jesus Not only do we lean on him and stay close to him, we have to conform to him. We've got to obey him. There's a man, a good Christian. He lay on his cot, gazing around the little hut. He's a missionary and his few possessions. He has some close friends there at his deathbed. And he made this powerful statement. He said, I wish... I had something to leave to each one of you. But I gave it all to Jesus a long time ago. And this is all I have left. My friends, if we're going to be rooted in him, if we're going to abide in Jesus, we need to give it all to him. Give all our cares, our concerns, our problems to lean on him. Whatever he asks us to do, to obey him. That's to abide in Jesus Christ. Lord.